I'm back, Jim. Okay, um, Matthew. All right, well, let's talk about chronic pain. Contract syndrome. Syndrome. Let's talk about chronic pain syndrome and then we'll go on to the other. Um, the problem with is first off with the diagnosis. Um, there is a big difference between chronic pain and chronic pain syndrome. Um, chronic pain syndrome isn't just long-term pain. There's a whole cascade of other shit going along with it, yeah? So you've got things like um, hormonal disturbances, um, psychological disturbances, personality disturbances. Um, these are almost stereotypical, these patients, these chronic pain syndrome. They're, it, the condition is really recognized by two things, as far as I'm concerned, three things. One is they've got very similar personalities. They tend to be passive aggressive. Um, they're completely helpless. They have no function of functional ability whatsoever. I can't do this. I can't do that. My pain stopped me from cleaning. Is there anything you can do? No. Um, you want to actually either cut their throat or your throat, but you figure somebody needs to be put out of their misery. Yeah, that's the personality you tend to be dealing with. Um, they've got almost no function, as I say, and everything hurts and you can't find much to explain how much pain they're getting when you do a mechanical exam. Is that pretty much how you recognize them? I would say that's pretty spot on more often than not. Yeah. Um, and if they do start getting better, um, they actually get a little bit aggressive and hostile about it. As opposed to long-term pain, now you get a totally different conversation with these people. They're focused on the pain, but it's a, it's a specific focus. I've got pain here, it goes there, I don't like it, um, do something about it. As opposed to, well, nobody understands all the pain I've got. And it, the whole thing just spreads out and it smears everybody it comes across. Um, I think the, the real, what you, the one thing you don't want to do is treat these people um, mechanically. Um, or actually, you don't really want to treat them at all. I'm sorry, but you actually don't want to treat them at all. Not with manual therapy, not with orthopedic therapy. These are really not orthopedic patients. Um, what was the other thing I was just reading about it? Chronic pain syndrome. I just saw it just a couple of days ago. Um, actually, sorry, have I got more people coming in? Am I missing people? Okay. Sorry, guys. Just so on the Fred. Fred's out there marketing to a degree. Well, that's good. He's getting a sense of how much he's doing. <laughs> All right, we're talking about chronic pain syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. So, as I say, basically, these are people that you really wouldn't invite into your house for a party. Yeah. And I don't think that treating them orthopedically is going to be your best bet. If you start manipulating, you're going to have a friend for life. Um, this really does, I'm not actually running these people down. They've got what they've got and what they got is about the worst thing you can get because you can't get rid of the bloody thing. Um, and they need drug rationalization. They've usually been made worse by the doctor by giving them all sorts of drugs. But you need drug rationalization. It needs to be decreased. It needs to be, they need to be put on a, a more appropriate drug regime, which isn't about painkilling, um, because painkillers do nothing for these. Um, and you need to keep your hands off them. So Matthew, you're seeing that a lot of these, what do you do with them? Apart from well, your hands it's, <laughs> um, it's a bit of a challenge with trying to incorporate some of the manual techniques um I don't it's, think it's appropriate. not so much no uh, it's more like mobilizations like low-grade mobilizations like i don't want to say one because that's not much but up to about a three two three uh mobilizing joints just trying to improve movement patterns and whatnot um and and some patients have been getting better with it um, and, and a lot of patients move better, which is a huge bonus. Um, they're seeing improvement with things, but, or I'm seeing improvement with things, but the challenge is when they start to get better, it's almost like they start to get madder 
and they almost mm. start to like resist and it's like you know you're doing stuff and you're like okay this joint was moving terribly before you know you start working on it it's moving better there's some improvement in strength you can you know get objective improvement but then the reports are not there you know they they almost start to withdraw and they just get kind of get very angry and then they start saying that yeah. the treatment's effective so that's kind of where i was like it seems like personality wise there's a change in identity like it's almost like you're making them better and they're getting mad at you so i was just curious if there's any um well, insight you have to that that is their identity their condition is now their identity and you're taking it away i don't think honestly they should be being treated by with physiotherapy unless they're also being treated by a psychologist Okay. I've got an awful lot of respect for that profession, but I think if you find a decent one who's dealing with chronic pain properly, then I think they, you need to be sharing this patient. Okay. Um, but a lot of it is about, is about diagnosis. A lot of patients are diagnosed with chronic pain syndrome simply because they've had pain for a long time. I've had patients that had neck pain for five years. You do a manipulation and the pain goes away. Now that was yeah. chronic pain syndrome, just long-term pain. Um, my best advice Get somebody else to treat them. Okay. <laughs> Start paying, like, get a, a bulk order of Prozac itself. <laughs> okay. It's soul destroying. So is, it, 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 uh, yes. is there any, like, neurophysiological things that we could explain to the patient like what is your take on that for patient education my take on that is that we don't know enough about neurophysiological about neurophysiology to start with and this should be the doctor's bloody job if you want to like to do this if you're going to do that you need it's not just neurophysiology this is hormonal as well a lot of these people are actually post-traumatic stress disorders um, so how much do you want to get involved in that um, so you're going to have to do a lot of studying in order to be able to present a scenario for the patient that actually works for them and doesn't make them worse, because that's always a risk. And I honestly don't think that we're qualified to do that. This should be the doctor's job, but they don't like them either. Um, <laughs> You know, I, when I was in Edmonton, that same in Calgary, actually, but in Edmonton, there was one, one therapist who was really good with chronic pain syndrome. She worked with a host of other doctors, including psychologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, not ENT, uh, hormonal guys, well, endocrinologists. Endocrinologists. Yeah. A whole bunch of people um, to do this. And I, how the hell she did it, I don't know. She did it for 30 years. But I seriously don't know how she survived that. That, that sounds awful. <laughs> um, I think yeah. I would have PTSD after doing that for 30 years. I, I have PTSD after doing it for 30 minutes. <laughs> I have PTSD just talking about it. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, I, I kind of agree with Jim, you know, for the most part with that, that the psychological aspect of this stuff really gets to be so hard for some of those people because they they told they started identifying with themselves because of their condition you know this is this is who i am this is what i have and you know i don't i, I don't really know what goes on when you start to get, make things better i mean there is the possibility that some of these joints have stiffened to avoid painful ranges of motion you know they're they're guarding against these things and you improve the range and all of a sudden they're getting into these ranges that are that weren't comfortable to begin with um, you know, so essentially that could be, that could be a component of some of that stuff and that, that plays into what Jim's saying about, you know, is manual therapy going to be appropriate for some of those patients? So, well, you know, if you're going to improve range, but you're improving range into a painful range, into a painful position, that's not necessarily a good thing for the patient, right? And that, that they're so delicate when it comes to their psychology about this yeah. stuff, it's, it's tough to get there. The other thing is like some of these issues. Are trying to recover is extension. In pretty much all right. of these cases, you're trying to get them to open out because they're in this position. They're all crouched over, and they don't they they won't expand. And I guarantee you that pretty much everything you're trying to do is to get them to open, to go into extension. I bet you there's not many that you're working to try and get them to flex. 
And it is, I mean, that is, uh, there's nothing mechanically wrong with these joints. They just don't want to do that. I've stopped believing, by the way, I've stopped believing a long time ago in adaptive shortening. So I don't believe these joints are adaptively shortened. And if they are, the chance of you actually being able to do anything about stretching those tight tissues is just about zero. The way we do mobilizations. This is all about um, mechanical input. And yeah, I think, I think that's it. They associate themselves, their identity is their pain. And as soon as you start removing the pain, they start getting hostile about it. Because it's their identity. Tough, tough stuff. If I was you, Matthew, I'd, I'd see if you can get more different patients. <laughs> right, there's not an awful lot that we, that you're learning on this course that is usable on these patients. And if the patient actually starts enjoying what you're doing, this is why massage is completely contraindicated. If the patient actually starts to enjoy what you're doing, you've got a patient for life. That, that has happened to me yeah. more times than I care to admit. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, man. I mean, and that's a chronic pain syndrome patient who walks in and we moan about, oh, my back and my knee and my leg and everything hurts me. And then one day they come in and go, I've got pain right there. And then they'll talk about that pain sensibly, like an ordinary non-chronic pain syndrome. And you're having a conversation, obviously, I'm talking to an ordinary person here. And that turns out to be something you can treat. And then I say, well, can you treat my neck like that? No. It's really weird. If they get an actual new pain, which is musculoskeletal. To say, I don't think most of these pain, this pain is musculoskeletal. Um, but if they actually get a new pain, a new problem that's musculoskeletal, they tend to talk about it normally. Uh, uh, yeah, I found, found a new line of work before I started to do that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> all right, can we move on? Is that all right for you, Matthew? No, it's not really, but that's about as good as I'm going to do. It, it, it's about as good as I, I think we may get, which is, is fine. I was just looking for... for well, if you don't know the questions, you'll never to apply some... some yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> trying to apply <laughs> some of the... Your treatment horizon. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about clinical reasoning, unless somebody's got another topic for me. Your choice, or you can have clinical reasoning. Get to, um, I had emailed you about like shoulder impingement, especially with a couple weeks ago talking about when, you know, they come in with that on the referral pad and you know that the impingement yeah. pattern is not really what you're treating. You're more than likely treating a tendinopathy. Um, but then if you get into, okay, what is the etiology here? What was the mechanism of injury? And do I need to go looking for a source of this pain depending on how it began in the first place? All right. um, I think it's a stupid term anyway, impingement syndrome. If somebody said I had a pinchy syndrome in my shoulder, nobody would take them seriously. That's exactly what impingement is. So if you're looking at things that can be compressed, you're looking at tendons, you're looking at the labrum can actually be um, compressed if everything's really off by the, the humeral head. You're looking at um, bursae, all sorts of stuff can actually get pinched there. If we look at tendinopathies though, I would say that if you ever, if this is not a tendonitis and it's a tendinosis, then almost certainly you're gonna to have to look for etiology. Um, and if you're seeing a tendonitis that doesn't have a good, obvious etiology, you are probably looking at um, medical condition. Is that okay? Like for tendonitis, you want direct trauma, you want serious, unfamiliar overuse, you need a, really something very obvious. If not, you probably should be assuming it's medical because tendinitis need a lot of push. Tendinosis, on the other hand, are gradual. And what you get there is not a cause, but a trigger. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that's another stupid term, rotator cuff syndrome, for Christ's sake. You know what a syndrome is? A syndrome is a characteristic collection of signs and symptoms that you don't know the cause of. Tendinopathy, you know what the pathology is. Um, yeah, it's not syndrome. It's rotator cuff related shoulder pain is, is what you'd see in most of the literature now being put out, kind of oh, generalizing all these shoulder pathologies under the one particular term. Stupid. Absolutely stupid. Why is the rotator cuff being Pretty much what you just said, Jim. Uh, you just lumped them all in there too. This is me off no end. Why do you put why put labels on stupid this? Stupid when it's not your idea. I don't, I don't know why you put a label on something and not a diagnosis on something. And that's not a diagnosis, is it? Yeah, it just drives me up the bloody wall. This um Yeah, it's, it's an umbrella term for all the related syndromes kind of lumped into one. Yeah. And what's good about this is it says at least you get an effort to tease it out. Why don't you just say... Once you accept a generalized term, you stop thinking. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's what labels do for you. They save you the trouble of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and your treatments become so very non-specific. Even though it's easy to lump, yeah. Yeah, lump everything under this, you know, rotator cuff related shoulder pain. You know, if you just accept that on face value, then, then you stop thinking. So the key then is saying, okay, I know it's in this big lump category. Now, how do I tease it out for the most specific treatment that's best for this individual? Yeah, well, that's not how you should do it. You base your treatment on the diagnosis and you progress your treatment as a pro as diagnosis progresses. Um, but what you have to understand is that the physicians are as mediocre as we are. There's as many very mediocre physicians as there are physical therapists per capita. And they need labels because they can't do reasoning. They can't do clinical reasoning. It's horrendous. And the more specialized they get, the less able they are to do reasoning in the area that's outside of their own. And then they don't reason in their own area because what they use then is pattern recognition. So, anyway, what was I saying? So, Tendinosis, you're almost certainly going to be looking for an etiology. The cause of the tendinosis is almost always a trigger. So the degeneration has been present for some time, um, but it's never reached a proprioceptive, sorry, a, noci a painful threshold. It's never been nociceptive, but it's not gone over into pain. So um, I think you're going to have to look for etiologists. Is that okay? Was that enough for you, Katie? Yeah. So when, when you're talking about the trigger and it's not going to be something that re they recognize as painful, like, well, I didn't ever do anything to my shoulder. And you ask about novel activities, like, okay, what was something unusual that would kind of trigger this? And when you really can't seem to find like the mechanism or the trigger, but you can reproduce it with those like provocative tests for, let's say the tendon, like the biceps, um, is that also a reason then to think maybe there was another etiology behind this? There has to be. There has to be. Things just don't get bad. Something has caused this. Um, there usually is a trigger. And it's usually something, even just working. Um, if you have a patient come in and says, Look, I don't know what's causing this pain. It's been getting worse for the last six weeks. Then it's not likely to be a tendon problem. Um, so this stuff has a tendency to start fairly quickly. Now, it may be a mild pain that gets worse, but the onset of the pain tends to be actually, oh, I've got that type of thing. So it may be just something like reaching in their back pocket, reaching over to pick their bag up, anything like that. Um, so there's generally a trigger, but if there's no trigger, you've got exactly the same problem. I've got, I've got a problem here and I made the diagnosis based on their history and their signs. Um, I know what the problem is, is that it, a bicep tendinopathy, tendinosis. And then you say, okay, what could cause that? So you have to work backwards now. You're looking at, for example, what mechanics, and probably mechanics is your easiest way to go. What mechanics could be causing that? If it's not mechanics, what neurophysiology could be causing that? If it's not neurophysiology, what neurology could be causing that? So, um, but you have to go in with an idea of what you're looking for, the etiology. Is that okay? Um, remember that 
this is the way I think about it anyway, that tendon is almost certainly been nociceptive for some time, not painful, but nociceptive. And you can check this on, on in class. If you go around and palpate um, common extensor tendon, uh, medial collateral ligament, that type of thing, you go around and palpate some of these areas, you're going to find that there is tenderness over a lot of these spots. So these are incipient pathologies. They haven't come, become um, painful, but they're tender, so they're nociceptive. You can then, this is good practice, you can then look, I'll give some abstract thought to the forces and the influences that can do this and then go looking for them. And there's a very, very good chance you'll find them. Even though the patient's not having pain. Um, and it's one of the things I do in classes on the on seven and eight, I just let you go around and palpate each other and then go and find the cause of it. But you're almost certainly gonna find that. So you've got that period where it's nociceptive but not painful. And what you may find then is um, segmental facilitation from that tendon because it's nociceptive. And then your real risk then is blaming the, the segmental facilitation for the tendinosis. Yeah? So this is where it can get confusing. When you're looking at etiologies, this is one of the confusing points. First off, is the etiology a cause or effect? And is it relevant to what they're bitching about? You can't just go and find every mechanical dysfunction you can and then treat it. You're going to hit the right one, but what you're doing is treating a lot of areas that don't need it, and that's never a good idea. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. You're really trying to avoid this clinical reasoning stuff, aren't you? <laughs> All right, so I want to talk a little bit about um, where are we for time? Okay, bias, bias and error. And there's something like, oh God, two dozen, no more than that. There are dozens and dozens of listed errors and biases in uh, clinical reasoning and critical reasoning. Remember that clinical reasoning is just a subset of critical reasoning. Um, but there's dozens upon dozens of biases and errors. Now the bias, both of those are subconscious. Um, it just happens to you. And it's in part the way you go at things. But the ones I find are most common for us is, well, these three. Um, anchoring, availability, framing, regression to the familiar, a premature closure. Now, premature closure tends not to be a problem for anybody but experts. And all premature closure is, is when you shut the examination down too early because you know what the problem is. So you see this a lot with um, pattern recognition. And most pattern recognition practitioners, ones who can do pattern recognition, do it well, and it tends to be um, fast, very fast, uh, very, very fast, three or four questions and maybe one test, something like that. It's very fast, it's very accurate usually. So it's a very efficacious method of doing diagnosis. The problem is when it goes wrong, it goes terribly wrong. And the only way you can get over that is to finish a whole exam off. And not many experts will do that. As I say, it's not really a major problem if you're not terribly experienced and have had good experience. It's not just a matter of years, it's a matter of reflective practice. Yeah. Anchoring is a big one. And anchoring is about taking, what I see is it's about taking too much information in and you're confusing yourself. You're getting overwhelmed by the amount of information you're taking in and you grab the first thing that comes to light and you hang on to it for dear life. You won't let go of the bloody thing, regardless of what other information comes in. That's angry. Availability is about you having something in your head. Um, it may have been a course you've just been on. And you must have noticed that you go on a course and everything ends up being in that condition for about four weeks. 
you can't get away from it and then it drifts off. Uh, but it may have been a patient you saw last week who looked a bit like this one and that suddenly comes to mind. Framing, um, this is usually blamed on um, reading reports before you examine the patient. Imaging reports, lab reports, reading con consultation letters, taking notice of what the bloody doctor says the problem is. So you get framed by this and you won't get out of the frame. But there's another one and that's asking the wrong question first off. Somewhere I've got a video of this. Um, not a video, uh, PowerPoint on this. It's like saying to somebody, okay, why, why are you coming here today? Why are you seeing me today? And then you'll get all sorts of stuff. Well, my doctor said I've got to come and see you. And she says that my headache is coming from my neck and you can treat it, but I don't believe that. So now you spend 15 minutes explaining how that may be true and it may be coming from a neck. And yes, you can treat that. And you still don't know what the problem is. So everything you're saying now really doesn't help anything. I don't want you to manipulate my neck. I had a chiropractor manipulate, I don't want it done. And nobody knows what the hell's wrong with this patient yet. So you spend 15 minutes talking to them about how you're different from a chiropractor. And if you don't want manipulation, you won't do it, but you'll explain what you do. And you still don't even know what it is yet. You're better off just talking about their symptom. Where's your headache? And if they go on about the doctor, say, yeah, fine. I need to know where the headache is though, before we can talk about this. I need to know your symptoms. So you can frame yourself as well. Regression is familiar. Um, it's a bit like anchoring. Basically, you're getting so much information is your brain says, screw this, I'm overloading. Let's go and make it a segmental dysfunction. And this is really common. This now becomes what I want it to be. It is a segmental dysfunction, even though it may not look anything like it. So these are the major biases now. Apart from premature closure, where the solution is to complete the exam, the other ones can be offset and possibly eliminated by doing differential diagnoses. Okay. Now, I don't recommend that you do di differential diagnosis formally as a method of, um, di of clinical reasoning. The reason is it gets messy, it gets very, very messy. It's, do you remember the program House? He did differential diagnosis. So they come up with a list of maybe five or six things it could be, and then investigate them all. Yeah. Um, and usually what happened was he'd, he'd get them to the point where he's doing something to them and they, they almost die. And he said, it was the same thing every week. They almost die. He saved their life. Still doesn't know what's wrong with them. And then he's walking into an elevator or something and he hears somebody say something and he goes, oh yeah. It is not clinical reasoning, all right? And it gets very messy. But you can certainly use it to reduce bias and error. And I think it's a good idea. So I'm going to give you a case. And... I am going to ask each one of you for a diagnosis, all right, based on this case. So let me see. This is a 40 year old woman complaining of pain, left buttock, a um, little bit into the L5S1, the lumbar sacral region, but most of it is in the buttock. She has trouble moving in any direction. Bending is painful for her, being bent over. Walking is a problem for her. Um, so all of these movements are painful. Sitting for a prolonged period also helps her, hurts her rather. On examination, you find that extension and left side flexion is particularly painful. Same area to the buttock. Um, and rotation to the left is also painful. Flexion is limited and a bit painful. All right, as is right side flexion. Any, okay, let's leave it there. So what are you thinking? 
and I'll take some of these down. Let's see if I can do this. So, um, all right, Katie, your picture's on there. Give me a diagnosis. Uh, L5S1 extension subluxation. Okay. What else we got there? The other Katie. Katie Spencer. You were there. Are you still there? I'll come back. Matthew. And you don't have to make a new one. If you like that one, that's fine. All right. I had the same thing written down L5S1 extension subluxation. Okay. All right, JC. So I had that one, but another one possibly could be like a sacroiliitis, possibly referring to that area. All right. Okay. You got to make me call all your names out, Ken. Let's see who else still got on here. This is uh, Steve here. Um, I was thinking potentially some sort of disc pathology, potentially herniated disc. Okay. Lateral stenosis. Okay. Uh. Everybody one okay, so is that everybody? I think it is, isn't it? All right, so that's your diagnosis. Now the question is what's your differential? So if we look at this, an extension subluxation, all right, what, this is weird, I can't do anything with this. All right, extension subluxation. Is there anything about the presentation that would suggest that it's not? Directions is painful or was limited in all directions that wasn't asymmetrical? Yeah, your range of motion um, was certainly an issue, wasn't it? For this. Now the question is, is that enough for you to change your diagnosis? Does it fit anything better? Disc herniation, I think. Okay, so we can come back to that. So that would be your differential diagnosis, yeah? Prove it. Question, test, prove it. Um, you could do um, AP shear um, as, as well as um, that compression, um, that lumbar compression test or the lumbar rotation test. Um, and subjective questioning for that could be um, pain upon coughing or bearing down. Um, could flare up if there is a disc herniation. Well, okay, let's look at these tests. Because you'd really, to, if you're going to do a couple of tests or a couple of questions for a differential, you need it to be specific. All right? Okay. Sensitivity really doesn't come into this, is about specificity now. So, first off, how good is the compression test? It's pretty much crap. Um, in fact, if this was a disc herniation, the child side, you couldn't bend the knees up towards the chest to be able to do it. Yeah. So disc herniations tend to be a catastrophe. Is that okay? Um, torsion testing tests a lot of stuff, uh, but it's not going to be great for a disc specifically. Um, it's, it's really good for acute pain. So one of the questions, what, haven't, what information haven't I given you on this case? Pain <laughs> and 
and the mechanism? Okay, and I don't feel sure that the mechanism is going to be of much help to you. Um, what if there's no mechanism here and I woke up with it? Woke up in the morning, sat up, got sudden sharp pain in that area, and it got worse over the next hour or two. Could that be a disc? If you had a trigger. Well, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. You very rarely see causes. Very rarely see causes. Uh, most of the stuff you're seeing is degenerative. And in this case, degradative. Um, but what is, what's the major difference between a biomechanical dysfunction and a disc herniation? Biomechanical is going to be more episodic. They've likely had that problem before. Okay. Um, I'm going to get, be a nasty person and say this is the first time they've had it. Okay. Are they able to do those things that they enjoy so it's not limiting essential activities versus like the significant pain of the disc herniation? All right. Let's change the terminology a bit then, shall we? Um, the things they have to do are not really the things that they enjoy doing. Going to work, sitting in a car, sitting on a train, they're not generally things you enjoy doing. So it's not the greatest question. What you really want to know is do they have obligate or elective functional loss? Yeah? And you're right, sacroiliac joint subluxation is unlikely to give you obligate. Now, the real question here is how bad is the pain? Isn't it? How intense is this pain? So for a subluxation, we're looking at moderate pain. A disc herniation, we're looking at severe pain. Is that okay? So there's one question I can ask. If this is not severe pain, it's probably not a disc herniation. If it's a type of disc herniation that does gradually progress, that is a, um, a contained herniation rather than an uncontained herniation, it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, over the period they've had this, it will be getting worse and worse and worse. So my follow-up question is, if this is not seriously painful, is it getting worse? Yeah. Um, but if we're looking for an uncontained herniation in this area, first off, does it look like one? Where's the pain? Is it referred? And if so, how much? So this is very limited in this referral area, isn't it? Let's assume this is severe pain, all right? The referral area is limited. It's only into the buttock. So the chances are that this isn't a disc herniation of the uncontained variety. Because these will generally hit the dura at the very least. Which also means the straight leg raise should be positive. So if I now do a straight leg raise and the straight leg raise is negative, then I'm pretty sure this is not a disc herniation. And that's what you're trying to do with differential diagnosis. You throw a whole bunch of differential diagnoses up and you disprove them. I would say, given the introduction of this, your primary diagnosis of it being L5S1 is probably spot on. Atypical, yes, but it probably is that. So we can get rid of the differential diagnosis of a disc herniation by a moderate pain, negative straight leg raise, and no referral, and no obligate functional loss. So any two of those things would tell you it's almost certainly not a disc herniation. All right, sacroiliitis. What do you think? Do you have a test for that? We have tests for this. What we'll test? Come on. 
So if, if they point to Fortin sign right away, and that's consistent with where you describe where they are, then we would go ahead and do some primary SI joint. Yeah, uh, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I would look at Fortin's finger test subjective and Fortin's finger test objective. Um, and then you can start playing with it. But if you have a sacroiliitis, you can't move the hip. I don't think you have to worry too much about the primary stress test because we don't know how good they are. But basically, as soon as you start moving the SI joint around by moving the hip around, they're going to be in trouble, almost in any direction. Um, but this could be an SI joint dysfunction. Now, I would include that with a lumbar dysfunction. So I, rather than say it's an L5-S1 extension subluxation, my thought would be that this is a biomechanical dysfunction of the lumbar area, which includes the SI joint, and then try to figure out which joint it is. And what do you think? Is it the SI joint or is it the lumbar spine? From the information you've got. From this information, I would say it's probably more so likely that it's coming from the lumbar spine. Why? Just because it's the pain is more so referred into the buttock versus one spot in that area. Uh, but you haven't asked. See, that's the thing with Fordings. They're, you're going to ask them where the pain is. They're going to tell you it's in the buttock. That's why you need to ask them to put one fingertip on it because they're not going to volunteer that um, automatically. You're going to have to search for that. That's why it's a test really, rather than a symptom. Um, you have to ask them about it. Now, I haven't gotten into the result of that yet. So it may be positive, it may not. We could also ask them if it hurts when they're rolling in bed. That would be, a, that would be an inflamed SI joint rather than an SI joint dysfunction. You can get an awful lot of pain from the SI joint being dysfunctional, I mean, a biomechanical dysfunction. Sim I think probably simply because of the size of the bloody joint. And there's going to be a lot of nociceptors involved in this. Um, but you can have a lot of pain, particularly on the first episode. Um, but what you tend not to get is referral upwards from the SI joint. But at the same time, you would expect the lumbar spine itself, the local pain, to be more intense than the buttock pain. Was it? If you look at the way I gave you that, I said they're complaining of pain in the buttock and a bit of a spread in the lumbar spine. Which one's worse? Buttock. The buttock pain. So the chances are they've got both going on. And if you ask them about Fort sign, they may well point to two spots. One in the lumbar spine, one in the SI joint. And you, you've got to accept those as being where the pain is coming from. Maybe not be where it's worse, but where the pain's coming from. So they probably have both of them, and it's not unusual to get that. Yeah. Um, lateral stenosis, is it? We didn't get any information on any numbness, tingling, or aching, or fatigue in the leg. Or there may, but they may not be a radiculopathy there. Okay. With the information you've got, is there any reason to suspect this isn't lateral stenosis? It's force with long sitting periods. Yeah, yeah, that should be opening up the frame. So they've either got two problems there, or this is unlikely to be a lateral stenosis. Yeah? What test would you do for lateral stenosis? Compression, distraction? No, not really. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that test because it's an interesting sort of test. Now, PAs, and you're looking for something stiff. This is a seriously degenerative condition. So you'd expect to feel at least one of your PAs 
being stiff and possibly all of them being stiff. And of course, locally, it's gonna be painful as well. So chances are this isn't lateral stenosis, plus the fact, how old was the guy? 40, weren't he? So unless he's got a history of trauma there with a fracture where you can expect callus and everything else going on, he probably doesn't have lateral stenosis. I strongly suggest that with every diagnosis you make, just for a learning thing, with every diagnosis you make, you line up four differential diagnoses. All right. And you can do them after you've seen the patient, a piece of paper and do it, work through it. And eventually you'll be doing it automatically. If you're not already doing it, you may well be already doing it. But the trick now is not to look at them and say, no, it's not that, it's not likely. This isn't a matter of likelihood. This is a matter of given the presentation of the patient, is this possible? And what questions and tests would I do to make sure it's not possible? Yeah? And I think it's actually one of the best learning mechanisms you've got. All right. Um, the next webinar I'm doing, I think, is going to be on um, script focused abduction and talking about bias as well. So it'll all be brought in. So as soon as that's out, um, you'll know about it. I just got to work up the, the life force to do it right now. I'm, I'm not in the mood. Um, all right, just a word about compression and traction. If you have a disc patient, a disc herniation patient, they land on their back, their knees are bent up, okay? And this is now a proper disc herniation because that's what you want to do it on, isn't it? And if you want to do it on stenosis, we can talk about that as well, but you want to do it on a disc herniation. They're laying there with their knees bent up, all right? Just resting knees up. How much pain are they typically in, in that position? A reasonable question. What do you think? Moderate. Hmm? Moderate, at least. Probably don't have any pain at all. I was going to say less pain than if their legs were straight. Yeah. They're usually okay in that position. That's where they want to be or on their side. Um, but they're actually not too bad there. They're not in agony. Now, if you're going to do compression, first off, you have to bend the knees up, which means you've got flex the lumbar spine. And that is generally going to cause a lot of pain. All right. And then you do the compression. Now, that may or may not be painful. It depends on how, theoretically, it should increase the bulging on the disc. It probably doesn't. Okay. It probably doesn't. Um, so it may or may not be terribly painful when you do it. But let's assume it is painful. Then you put the legs back down and you do traction. Now, what would make that first part of the test a positive for a disc herniation with a traction? The first test of compression or the first test of traction? Uh, which way do you want to do it? Oh, well, you're looking for the reproduction of the referral. Of the with procedure. which one? Compression. Okay. Do you want to do that one first or do you want to do it second? I think you're supposed to do them in order of more painful. So you do traction first, then do compression. Okay, fine. Is traction going to relieve a pain that's not there? No. Is traction, the idea of doing traction is what? is to suck the disc back in, that don't happen. So how is traction supposed to help the pain of a disc herniation compressing the dura, for example? Mm -hmm. 
then you do the compression, the compression positive. I did a very, this was years, I mean, decades ago, I did this in my clinic, looking at compression traction testing and torsion testing for so-called rotary instabilities, yeah? And I was looking for pain reproduction and release. Now, I didn't bother with the traction, it's compression and rotation. And this was on acute backs, all right? These people were coming in with severe back pain. Didn't worry about the diagnosis, just these tests. These tests were all positive, torsion and compression, until the acute pain went away and then the test became negative. Now, none of these were disc herniations. This is about aggravating things that are already painful, as opposed to specifically testing for disc herniations. I won't put too much faith in these. Plus the fact you really don't need these tests for a disc herniation. Disc herniations are not a mystery. They have pain going down the leg. The pain in the leg can often be as bad or worse than the pain in the back. All movements are painful. All functions are painful. They have obligate dysfunction. They probably will have a radiculopathy, probably. Um, if you do a straight leg raise, it's going to be positive very early in the range, and neck flexion is almost certainly going to aggravate it. These are not a mystery. You don't need all these special tests to say it's a disc herniation. Try and do a PA on them, and it's going to end them screaming. And if you stand them up, they are deformed. Now, all that's true for an uncontained herniation. None of that is necessarily true and often isn't true for a contained herniation, all right? But if you're looking at contained, all of that should be there. You can also have discs that are completely a painful, no pain whatsoever, um, and they're just being picked up on MRIs, and then the MRI, the disc is being played, blamed for the patient's pain. And if you look at that MRI first, what bias are you going to be prone to? Framing. Yeah. All right. Any questions? I think next week, if it's okay, we'll um, you can suggest topics for me again, and you can make the same questions as well. Okay. I think it works better that way. You, you're engaging a bit more, and we're asked that. That was what about four different questions you gave me, and I think it works better. It does for me, and that's the main thing. Right. You're all very secondary here. It's all about me. All right, guys. Have a good week. Thanks for your time, Jim. Thank care. you. Bye.